you, when you look at the U.S. policy toward Israel, some people find it so complex and some people find it so simple. How do you find this policy toward Israel and how do you see this alliance? Uh, first off, there is no alliance. This is a, a wide misperception. Uh, after the last time the Arab nations did actually uh, hit out and attack Israel in 1973, uh, Kissinger and Nixon and others decided, well, you know, it might be a good idea to make sure that never, ever happens again. And so they offered, they offered Israel a defense alliance. Whoa, a mutual defense treaty where if anyone attacked Israel, the U.S. would be automatically involved. I mean, hello, guess what the Israelis did? They said, oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> thanks, but, but no thanks. We, we like it just the way it is now. Why would they want it just the way it was now? Well, because for a lot of reasons, but one is that a mutual defense treaty requires one country to tell the other, well, we're going to head out against Syria, for example. We just want to let you know that the Israelis don't want any part of that. They would much rather seek forgiveness rather than permission. And so the Israelis felt very confident that, that they had such a hold on the White House, the Congress, and the media they didn't need a mutual defense treaty. They liked it just the way it was. So bottom line here, there is no there is no alliance with Israel. Israel is not in the literal sense, in the international and the legal sense, our ally. OK, now that may seem like a, a fine point to most people, but, you know, referring to it as an ally, well, it gives them a mis a misimpression. Let me, you know, you ask whether it's simple or it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, you know, I'd like to maybe just share out of my own experience. You know, I was around. Uh, one of the benefits of being as old as I am is you're around for important things. And I was around, I was only nine years old, but I was around when Israel, when the Jews got their own country. All right. I lived in New York City. There was great rejoicing. You couldn't, there were parades. There was great rejoicing. The Jews persecuted Jews, and they were, of course, during World War II, had found a homeland, okay? Now, nobody told me then that there were people already there. Like, uh, nobody told me then that the Israelis drove out more than 700 thousand Palestinians to make room for Israel. Now, it was sort of like an oversight, huh? Well, it gave me a, a very wrong impression about what the equities were there in the Middle East. And of course, uh, many of those people driven out of uh, what was in Palestine to accommodate the Jewish settlers uh, were people that ended up in Gaza. And so the people in Gaza now are direct descendants, most of them direct descendants of people who were expelled by the Jews, many forcibly into Gaza, uh, grandsons, granddaughters, uh, many, some of them actually are the sons and daughters of these settlers, or these not settlers, these Palestinians that were driven out. That's big, okay? People don't know that. What else? Well, uh, when I became a professional analyst of Russian or Soviet affairs in the 60s, um, yeah, I was really sort of confused. It was complicated, okay? Confused that anything I wrote that mentioned the word Israel had to be approved by a fellow named James Jesus Angleton on the operation side of the house, who was in direct contact with Israeli opposite numbers, and was pretty much the the go-to guy in the CIA for anything having to do with Israel. I filed that away in my mind. I said, well, that's just so strange. Uh, then I noticed that the Mid-East branch, the Mid-East branch in the Office of Current Intelligence, we were 
glorified journalist, right? We had access to all manner of information, but most of it came from open sources. The Mideast branch had no people of Jewish extraction in there. I said to myself, wow, that's interesting. And he asked the branch chief. He said, oh, yeah, that, that's that's deliberate. We, You know, it may be unfair, but we don't really think that anybody who's who's a, you know, of Jewish extraction, they, they might have trouble being objective on the Israel-Palestine. So, so we pick other people. Oh, I thought yeah, that's a little un-American. But then I thought, you know, there was a time in the 70s when uh, there were real troubles in Northern Ireland. And I was deathly afraid that I would be selected to be the analyst of Irish affairs. And I would have had to say, no, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. Not with all the, not with all the tales that you know, the real things that my grandmother told me. No, no, I can't. I would have to refuse because I couldn't even pretend to be unbiased or unprejudiced. So it made sense to me. So that was, that was one thing that, uh, that I realized. And then there was also, uh, even among the people in the Mideast branch, a kind of a bravado, thinking that the Israelis were really superior to the Arabs. And when the June 1967 war happened, uh, you know, the Arabs took a real l licking, and uh, the analysts, even though not of Jewish extraction, were, you know, so those, those Arabs, they don't stand a chance against the Israelis, you know. And then in 1967, of course, uh, the Israeli forces attacked the USS Liberty, a U.S. Uh, intelligence collection ship in international waters, tried to sink it, killing all 300 members of its crew. Whoa, I thought that was pretty nasty because we had the intercepts showing that the Israeli pilots, after reconnoitering all this stuff for earlier in the day, they came back to the control tower and said, these are American ships, those have American flags. Do your orders, perform your orders. Boom, 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 okay? Now, what happened? Well, the end result was, what, 34 U.S. sailors killed, many of them Marines, 170-plus wounded. And it was only because a very imaginative sailor from Texas uh, got, a, got a communications device up and, and able to send out an SOS that made the Israelis break off the attack since they intercepted the SOS, of course, and the ship was not sunk. Uh, and there were many survivors, very few unwounded. Now, I learned that uh, that didn't really matter. Nobody protested about that. It was not in the news. And just fast forward now, uh, that was 1967. 2007, I'm reading uh, this book by John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt. It's called The Israel Lobby. And it came out, it's interesting, interesting, illustrative example here. It was commissioned by, I forget which magazine, it could have been The Atlantic or some very, very mainstream magazine. Would you write this? And and when they got the draft, they said, oh, my God, um, you know, we'll pay you what we what we said we pay for we get publishers. <laughs> they had to go to the London Review of Books to get the thing published. And I saw that as soon as it came out. I said, I'm going down to make a lecture tour in Missouri, of all places. But I ought to read this thing on a plane, printed it out, read it on a plane. I'm talking to a... A church, the biggest church hall in Springfield, Missouri, by invitation. 300 people there, okay? And um, I'm talking about Iraq and all the lies about Iraq and Syria and so forth. And um, in the Q&A, uh, uh, somebody said, well, have you read Mearsheimer and Walt's book about the Israel lobby? Because you've been referring to Israel here. And I said to myself, 
thank you, Jesus. Because <laughs> I had just read it on the plane, right? And I said, yeah, I have read it. And somebody said, well, what do you think of it? I said, well, the thing that mystified me is that as excellent as the book is in adducing evidence of the uncommon influence that the Zionists have in our government, it missed the, the main one. And the question is, so what do you mean main one? I said, well, they missed the USS Liberty. And they looked at it at 300 faces, right? And they're blank stares. And so I said, well, how many of you know about the USS Liberty? Three hands go up, okay? One in, way in the back, one in the middle, one, uh, one right in front. So I picked the one in the front. Sir, what do you know? Ramrod Strait, he stood. Marine Sergeant Bryce Lockwood, USS Liberty crew, sir. So I caught my breath and I said, uh, uh, Sergeant Lockwood, would you come up and tell us about this? He says, sir, I've not been able to do that. But I'd like to try to do that today, this evening. So he came up and he told. He had a fish out. His Marine contingent, the ones that were monitoring conversations all over the Middle East, fish them out before they washed out to sea through the torpedo hole. He told the whole, whole schmear, okay? Now, what's my point there? The point was that I didn't know any of that, really. And uh, later I learned that, uh, that the USS Liberty crew was told not to tell anybody about any of this under pain of court-martial. They couldn't tell their wives what had happened. And just to finish up on this, I got very friendly with Bryce Lockwood and many of his colleagues, the survivors. And uh, when, what's his name? Halbardier was his name. Uh, Seaman uh, Halbardier from, from Texas uh, was the guy that put the Bailey Wild together and got that SOS out. He was being honored by a congressperson in California. Uh, his name was Devin Nunes. Uh, he'd be familiar to a lot of people. And he was uh, he had employed uh, Terry Harbajie. And uh, he heard about what happened uh, on the Liberty. And he wanted to give him a big award. So he gave him the Silver Star, which is just below the... Uh, Medal of Honor. And as soon as I heard about that, I was on the next plane out there to meet all these people. There are only about a handful there. Uh, in his office, he was awarded. Medal. One of the press people said, oh, do you have any shrapnel scars? <laughs> oh, yeah, he sure did. But over lunch, over lunch, I learned, you know, you, you want to know what PTSD is? Talk to the alumni, talk to the survivors uh, the USS Liberty attacked by Israel. They told not to tell anybody. They couldn't even talk among themselves about it until just recently. So that was all suppressed, and it was part of my education. Now, let's go back to 2009, I think it was. Uh, the uh, director of national intelligence, he was an admiral. I'll think of his name in a second. But he had run into Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who many people rightly consider to be one of the brightest guys ever. Okay, He negotiated that very sticky problem with China and Taiwan, allowing all kinds of good things to happen. Uh, Admiral Blair, that's his name, decided, you know, it would be really good, given what happened on those terrible U.S. national intelligence estimates on Iraq, which were dead wrong, and the almost big mistake on Iran. Tell you what, let's let's appoint somebody who knows something about all this and is unbiased. And that was Ambassador Chaz Freeman. So Dennis Blair appointed him, and there were lots of rumblings about, oh, wait a second, he's, he's not sufficiently pro-Israel, okay? <laughs> And we wrote a, a memorandum to Blair saying, look, disregard this. This would be really good to have somebody heading up the National Intelligence Council, which surveys, which is in control, really, of the president's daily brief and the acme of uh, the, the genre 
uh, national intelligence estimate, which means something and can affect policy. Don't 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 listen to the Israel lobby. Well, in a word, Chess Freeman came in on the, in the morning as head of the National Intelligence Council, a position that did not need congressional approval. I mean, this was not even assistant secretary level. In other words, Chess Freeman was willing to do this for his friend because he knew how important it was to take a demotion in effect. But the Israeli lobby lobbied anyway, and he got a call, or he got a call from Blair. Oh, sorry, Chaz. The White House says you're out of here. How long was he in office? Six hours. <laughs> now, put yourself back in those years, 209. If you had somebody who knew which end was up, who knew about Israel, he had been actually ambassador to Saudi Arabia, he knew the Middle East, just like he knew China, like the palm of his hand. He was not only assistant secretary of defense, he was also uh, uh, an ambassador, uh, one of those career ambassadors. So there was a mischance, that was 2009. Let me continue on here now and, and talk about something that happened in, earlier on after Iraq, after the attack on Iraq, when troops were still there, um, I went back and I dug out an old article I wrote before our presentation today. And it started out eye for an eye. Revenge has not always worked out very well in the past, and particularly not in spirals of violence beginning in Gaza. Wow, what's this? Well, this would be an interesting story if people have enough attention to kind of listen to it. Uh, they may remember that back in March of 2004, four Blackwater operatives were killed and dragged around the streets and ended up in the city of Fallujah in Iraq. People thought, wow, you know, that was really unfortunate because that started a real bad sort of thing where... Fallujah was leveled by the U.S. Marines, okay, in retaliation for this so-called gratuitous attack on four Americans, okay? Yeah, they were, they were not armed forces. They were mercenaries. They were Blackwater, but they were American, and they were, their bodies were dragged around, okay? So, now, that happened on March 31st, 2004. It did not happen in a vacuum. Anybody know who uh, Sheikh Yassin was? Well, on March 22nd, so nine days before the Blackwater incident, Israeli forces assassinated Sheikh Yassin, spiritual leader of Hamas. Spiritual leader of Hamas a withering old man, blind and confined to a wheelchair, pretty easy for Israeli forces to target, right? Okay, so they killed him. Who was he? He was one of those Palestinians driven out of Palestine in 1948. I mentioned that before. His family settled in Gaza, became the spiritual leader of Hamas. Now, What's the connection here? Well, these black border people were not real bright. I mean, they should have had a, a navigation system. Maybe just a map would keep them out of trouble there in Fallujah, but they didn't have that. And this set the stage for really bad things, right? What happened? The black border operatives were killed by a group that described itself as the Sheikh Yassin Revenge Brigade. Oh, interesting. So, pamphlets and posters were all over the scene of the attacks. One of the trucks that pulled around the bodies of these poor guys, Blackwater guys, had in its window, Sheikh Yassin Revenge Brigade. Blackwater contractors, they're Americans, and that was exploited to level Fallujah, to level it with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of weapons that are causing and are still causing 
incredible birth defects in in uh, Fallujah now. What am I saying here? I'm saying that that these things don't have <laughs> to quote the Secretary General of the UN. These things don't happen in a vacuum, and in that case, the retribution against Fallujah initially started uh, marine general conway was ordered to go ahead and level it and then they said oh no the election is coming up better not as soon as the election was over fallujah was leveled and was leveled with the kinds of shells that have called all kinds of burst effects you wouldn't know that but my point here of course is that it didn't start didn't start with just the the killing of these guys it started with the murder of a feeble, crippled spiritual leader happened to be of Hamas who had been driven out of Palestine in 1948. Um, now, at about that time, we had some testimony from General Petraeus. And I remember this very distinctly because he got into real trouble. He said something reasonably honest. <laughs> Pardon my, my sense of humor here. But, you know, he said, uh, what did he say? He said that the conflict in uh, Iraq is, uh, is fomented largely by uh, anti-American sentiment due to a perception of U.S. favoritism toward Israel. Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda and other militant groups exploit that anger to mobilize support. He didn't say that in his oral testimony, but it was in his statement. Still, he got in trouble deep. <laughs> he was so concerned that he immediately emailed Max Boot, par excellence, a fellow who is very favorable to Israel. And he said, look, can you do something? Because I, you know, I didn't say that. I just had my, my statement. But this is it. So we have the trail of the emails, which were released by accident by Petraeus himself. It's just so, so telling. I won't repeat it all, but he said, please, please write something to say that I love Israel. And I didn't mean to say that. Well, what he said, of course, was accurate. And you don't have to go very far. You could go to 9-11 itself. And, and I'll just repeat what, uh, what most people have not heard. And that is that uh, when they were looking for inf information about why the attacks on 9-11, you'd think that would be good to know, right? Well, uh, they knew that uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had uh, had studied in North Carolina, actually North Carolina, Greensboro at the North Carolina University there. OK, so uh, when he was captured during the writing of this 9-11, maybe I have this line. There it is. Uh, this literary gem. OK. <laughs> Uh, friends of mine who were working on the staff there uh, said, you know, I wonder, wonder, let's find Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and ask him why he did this. I mean, he's the mastermind. So, oh, this is great. Then we have something put in this book. <laughs> so let me see. I think it's on page 147, if I can find it. Okay. So they thought that uh, maybe Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had an affair of the heart in Greensboro, North Carolina, or maybe... Other students call them a towel head. Or, yeah. So here's the way that this sentence reads in the 9-11 Commission report. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's animus toward the United States stemmed not from his experience there as a student, but rather from his violent disagreement with U.S. foreign policy favoring Israel. Page 147, pretty much buried there. And then there's a little footnote. It says, wow, that's what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's nephew, Ramzi Youssef, said when he was convicted for trying to knock down the Twin Towers in 1993. What did he say? He said that I'm glad to be sentenced to 145 years in the maximum detention center because I did what was right because of my intense hatred for U.S. policy favoring Israel. Okay. Now, that doesn't come out anywhere, but that's the reality. And uh, there's maybe one other uh, instance that I will cite here, and that is uh, Syria. When the, the Syrian dissensions started, 
Uh, when people started demonstrating in Syria, uh, the people favoring Israel, the neocons, I mean, that's the definition of a neocon, at least partial definition, to give priority to Israel's interests, so our own interests. Um, they said, well, you know, let's disrupt things. Let's get rid of Bashar al-Assad. And that became U.S. policy. Uh, Obama, we're going to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. And we started fomenting and arming rebels, insurgents, terrorists. Oh, terrorists, but they were moderate terrorists. You get the idea? Moderate terrorists. We're, we're just training them on the Jordanian border, and they're going to see, of course, it, all kinds of havoc, right? And so uh, what happens is that the, the chief neocons, and I would say John Kerry deserves that appellation, uh, he sets up uh, Hillary Clinton. He and, I'm sorry, he and Hillary Clinton set up President Obama. There's a press conference, uh, let's see, uh, August 19th, 2000 2000 and well, let's see. I'll, I'll get I'll get the date right. Um, he sets a yeah. It's 2012, okay? Because one year later, 2013, uh, the, the the price has to be paid. What happens? Well, uh, Obama is making this uh, this presentation, this press conference, and as he's finishing up, he's saying, "Now look." Uh, uh, I'm not going to commit U.S. forces to Syria. Um, I, 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 you know, we're not going to do that. Okay, we learn from Iraq. And, uh, not really going well in Afghanistan. We're not going to do it in Syria. So. And then somebody puts a little paper in and, he's, and there's a question. He says, uh, <laughs> "Are there no circumstances under which you would commit U.S. troops to getting rid of Bashar al-Assad?" And he says, well, yes, there are. Um, actually, if the Syrians used chemical weapons or even moved their chemical weapons around, I would change my calculus. That would be different. OK, so August 19th, 2012, if memory serves, August 20th, 2013, there's an incident outside of Damascus blamed on the bad rebels, not the moderate rebels, but the bad rebels, okay, using sarin gas. 100 people killed, okay? Now, the way we re reconstructed it, we, it wasn't the rebels. This was a false flag attack. But John Kerry got up just a week later, and he said it was Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad, and now we have to attack uh, Syria because because you said we should, we had to be, Obama, you said if the chemical weapons were used. So, so Obama's in a bind, a bind that Hillary Clinton and later John Kerry put him in. So what does he do? Uh, he says at the end of August, well, you know, this is really a predicament. Uh, everyone thinks she's going to approve the launching of uh, missiles from the warships in the Eastern Mediterranean. But instead, he gets out in the Rose Garden and he says, I'm going to go to Congress this time. You know, Congress really is supposed to want to authorize war. So we're going to go to Congress. And the neocons are livid. No, you can't do that. Worse still, Obama goes to St. Petersburg for an economic summit. This is the first week of September 2013 and he meets with Putin and long story short Putin says I got a deal for you I admire your reluctance to start yet another war uh, we like Bashar al-Assad here's the deal we're going to get Bashar al-Assad to destroy all his chemical weapons under UN supervision uh, on a US ship outfitted for this kind of destruction all you have to do is say, yeah, it's a good deal. Obama says, really? He says, yeah, listen to the uh, the Syrian foreign minister tomorrow. He's going to make that announcement. He did make the announcement. Obama says, I don't have to make a war. This is a good solution. Thanks. Okay. Now, John Kerry wasn't with him. 
<laughs> John Kerry was traveling around Europe trying to drum up support for war on Syria. I kid you not, okay? As a matter of fact, this is really, I'll add this. Uh, a couple of days later, he's in London at a press conference. And he's talking about how, you know, we said we would do war on Syria if they use chemical weapons. Of course, false flag again, all right? But they use them, he says, okay? And uh, that's what's going to happen. We get Congress to approve. And Congress had a right to approve. It was about to approve. Menendez, Menendez. <laughs> okay, anyhow, so somebody says to, to uh, Kerry uh, in London, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, are there no circumstances under which uh, which war could be prevented? And Kerry says, and I quote, well, he could he could give up his chemical weapons. I mean, it's always the question you could give up his chemical. That's not going to happen. That's that's not in the cards. <laughs> End quote. This is three or four days after Obama agreed to do this, okay? He comes home and Obama says, oh, hey, John, I forgot to tell you. Here's the deal. Go back to Geneva, negotiate the end of it. We're out of the woods here. We don't have to have another war. Oh, now, maybe I'll add a little vignette because I was physically present together with uh, all the major neocons in Washington at the top of the CNN uh, headquarters in Washington by accident. They invited me there to do a little uh, remote interview with BBC London. I did the interview. I opened this little door and I oh, I almost knocked this little guy over, you know. I said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. He looked up at me. And I said, oh, my God, that's Paul Wolfowitz. <laughs> he says, well, watch where you're going. Watch where you're going. And I said to myself, no, no, Ray, no, no. Remember all that training in nonviolence you've had. <laughs> Don't do it. So I minded my 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 piece there and I watched these guys. Here's Wolfowitz. Here's Joe Lieberman on the other side of the room. They looked like they were at their mother's funeral, their mother having been run over by a Mack truck, you know. They didn't have the gaudy ties that they fancy were. No, they had black ties on it. And they're watching the tube and somebody is saying, oh, how terrible, how cowardly, how cowardly Obama is not to rise to the occasion. He promised, and now he's going to make peace, for God's sake, when we could have got rid of Bashar al-Assad. And I'm looking at this, and I'm like, God, will they let me stay? They did, okay? They didn't know I was there. So Wolfowitz and Lieberman go to a different room to have a, interview and we could see it on the book, book to him first the first thing uh, Lieberman says is you no know, this business about needing congressional authorization to start this kind of conflict that, that's for the birds that's not that's not real you know and I'm saying my god this guy been senator for over 20 years and he doesn't know article one of the constitution and then of course Wolfowitz black so anyhow you have to know how things to work in Washington I went to this very ornate elevator shaft which was between us and where they were in this room see and i waited there and i was dressed to the gills because i had my own interview right my best suit and so i looked like somebody important and the ethos in washington is you don't take any you don't take any 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 risk of not recognizing somebody you should know so so i'm standing there and they come in joe uh, paul how are you ray mcgovern and he said, oh, how Ray, show sure. long time. No, no. Now, look, uh, Joe, uh, here, here I, I cut up Article 1 of the Constitution that uh, Dennis Kucinich gave me. Uh, you ought to see that, you know, it's the, the Article 1, Section 8. Read it, will you? Because you should notice it. Hey, Paul, don't go away, don't go away. <laughs> oh, he says, I won't talk very much. Both of it. And then this. Beautiful, beautiful red-headed woman comes out, and she's six foot tall, and she looks down at what's happening. She says, oh, gentlemen, huh? I'm so sorry. And I said, I'm sorry, too. Why do you let these clowns on your show don't even know what the Constitution says? Well, that was my last interview at CNN, but it was worth it. <laughs> so, but, but that's, you know, that's an idea of what, 
what they would try to do in Syria. The last thing I'll say on this also pertains to Syria. Um, when all this stuff really went up, uh, there were lots of terrorist activity in Syria. I think we're talking like uh, 2000 and I only remember here, 2013, same year. Um, there were reports that uh, Obama was going to do do the worst, and uh, there was a uh, yeah, there was a, a reporter in uh, Tel Aviv at the time. Her name was Jody Ruderin. Uh, she was actually the New York Times uh, uh, bureau chief. So, to her credit, she goes to uh, uh, to high level uh, Syrian officials. And she says, "Well, what about this? You know, what what's what's going on here? What what? Why do you want? Uh, why do you want to have limited strikes on Syria? Your headline today, and uh, so she she talks to these people. Now, high level Israeli officials talk to the bureau chief for the New York Times, and sometimes they're even candid. And uh, one of them, Alon Pincus, who had been." Uh, in charge of the consulate in New York. He's a high level diplomat. Uh, this is what Judy Roderin wrote. And I, maybe I'll spoil the ending here, but this appeared on the front page of the New York Times on September 12th, 2013. Here it is. This is what I heard from top Israeli diplomats and officials in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Quote, for Jerusalem, the status quo, horrific as it may be from a humanitarian perspective, seems preferable to either a victory by Mr. Assad's government and his Iranian backers, or a strengthening of rebel groups increasingly dominated by Sunni jihadists. Alon Pincus told me, quote, this is a playoff situation in which you need both teams to lose. But at least you don't want one to win. We'll settle for a tie, says Alon Pincus. Let them both bleed, hemorrhage to death. That's the strategic thinking here. As long as this lingers, there's no real threat from Syria to Israel. So I commented here, that's sort of hypocrisy on steroids. And that's what we're seeing now. So what happened? Well, it was the first week of September. And I can only guess that the, the major censors in the New York Times were out in the Hamptons having martinis. And this got to be the lead article on September 12th, 2013. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that that was the, the, the Syrian policy. Um, I haven't mentioned Iran, but you know that uh, the Israelis were telling us that Iran, Iran was working on a nuclear weapon. Uh, suffice it to say that after all the propaganda kind of kind of drunk in by many analysts, including CIA analysts, and I might say parenthetically that are there analysts of Jewish heritage now in the Mideast branch of CIA? <laughs> All but one. <laughs> they have one nominal Palestinian that I know of, okay? Now, I'm a little dated on this, but that's where it was when I left. So a sea change and all that. OK, so um, th this this uh, situation is, is what uh, Obama had to deal with. And, you know, I'll say to his credit that he saw that Putin was willing to help on this and that he could avoid starting another war. And so he jumped at the chance. And actually, that was the acme of U.S. Russian relations, from which on down uh, 180 degrees. In other words, well, how about this? 
September 12th, 2013, Putin gets to write an article in the New York Times, an op-ed. And he says, you know, I'm really, really feeling good about the increasing trust, his words, increasing trust between not only our two countries, but between personally between Mr. Obama and me. There's only one thing that I disagree with him on heartily, and that is the notion that any one country is exceptional. Uh, Mr. Obama said that just last week in a, in a major address. I don't, I disagree. I disagree vehemently. Uh, I think that there are various countries, rich and poor, some closer to democracy, others uh, not so close. But when God looks down at all countries, he considers them all evil, period. <laughs> I'm sorry. He considers them all equal, okay, period, end quote. Now, I learned at the time that um, it was a pretty good report that Putin penned that last paragraph all by himself, the one I just quoted. And uh, proof of that came uh, about two years later when he did an interview. He was asked that question, you know, what do you, what do you think about all this? And, and he, he repeated that last paragraph virtually verbatim uh, confirmation of a kind that he actually did write this. Now, why do I mention that? Well, because they were able to work things out. Obama was able, with Putin's help, to avoid another war. Now, had that go over with the neocons that I described at the top of the CNN building, they were losing. What happened? What happened within six months? Coup in Kiev. It's a long story, but even Putin has said now. Uh, the, uh, Newland uh, admitted that they invested five billion with a B dollars into a coup in Kiev. They did the coup in Kiev, and of course things went down from there. So, so you know who's running our foreign policy? Uh, this long, long-winded way of saying it's the people who uh, have an affinity for Israel, a people who uh, who really don't look dispassionately about U.S. interests. And that, of course, comes into uh, bar relief now when you talk about how joined at the hip uh, Biden is with Bibi Netanyahu. That's really, really going to read down to everybody's uh, discomfort and real problems uh, as this Gaza thing goes on. And I, I hope we can talk a little bit about Gaza as well. Nimitz, thanks for letting me bloviate to the degree I have. My pleasure, Frank. Just talking about Gaza, Jake Sullivan recently talked about these ammunitions, these weapons that are sending to Israel. They, he said that we are taking care of the way that Israelis are using these weapons. How they can verify that? Is that possible? No, it's not. It's, it's rhetoric. Sullivan has been known to say things that are not true before. Uh, even if he told them, as I suppose he has, please, please, when you drop those uh, those big bombs, Make sure that uh, there are no civilians around. I mean, hello, how can you do this in a densely populated uh, part of the world like Gaza? Uh, it's hard to do. It's impossible to do the way the Israelis are, are uh, proceeding. And uh, the notion that uh, we can send these bombs and they say, well, don't, don't, let them, don't let them hit civilians. It's just ridiculous on its face. So what Sullivan says is... Uh, typically misleading and uh, doesn't make any sense. Northern part of Gaza right now is in the hand of Israelis. How do you see this? Are they capable of doing this? Are they capable of holding this part of Gaza? Is that possible for the size of military and the forces that they are having? Um, the people that I trust uh, on these military questions say no. Uh, they say, look, Israel has not even begun to win there. Uh, uh, Hamas is in these tunnels and all around, and it's impossible to defeat Hamas. Besides that, it's an ideology, for God's sake. So, uh, no, uh, Israel is not winning. And uh, the sooner that Biden comes to the realization that 
he's discrediting the United States by hanging in there and not not exerting the influence. Now, it's a textbook case of genocide, okay? I never thought that I would be a member of a country, a voting member, a person who served in the armed forces of a country that enabled genocide. Netanyahu could not do this without my country sending weapons, political support, you name it, to Netanyahu. We're doing that. I'm, I just uh, can't wrap my head around how shameful this is. Uh, we are vetoing ceasefire resolutions at the UN. It's going to come back to haunt us. You know, it's going to be one of these cases where, uh, oh, where, where Biden's going to have to make a decision. And he's an old guy and he's surrounded by Zionists. And I don't say Jews, I say Zionists. I mean, <laughs> it, there's a big, big difference. But I mean, Biden himself says, I'm, I'm a Zionist, I'm proud of it. Okay. Does he know what that means? I mean, Zionism started at the end of the 19th century, it was, it was a political movement. And it became the same movement that moved into Israel in 1948, which I mentioned before, and displaced the 700,000 Palestinians and then the Gaza and other places, okay? It's a political thing. And uh, it's not Jewish religion in the best sense. My God, you know, when you, when you talk about pure Jewish religion, you're talking about uh, respect for the poor. You're talking about the concept of tzedakah, uh, the actual pre-Aramaic word for justice, justice, mind you, which had in its denotation, not just its connotation, showing mercy to the poor. In other words, justice was showing mercy to the poor. And that's Abrahamic. That's Jesus of Nazareth. You know, take care of the widows, the orphans, the refugees. And that's the prophet. Okay, it's the same tradition. In that case, they're united. Justice is the preeminent value, and you give preference. You give preference to the poor. Is that anti-American? Well, in a sense, people say, no, no, everybody's equal. Well, that's not what the Abrahamic tradition is. Matter of fact, and I'll just mention this, I'm a Catholic, and I was very, very proud of the American Catholic bishops appointed by Pope John the Twenty Third, who who faced into the the question of economic inequality here in in our country in nineteen seventy four, I believe it was. I was teaching religion at the time, and uh, here's what they said: You hear about the preferential option for the poor. We know it comes from the Hebrew word tetka. We know that Muslims practice it in their in their religion. We're going to tell you what it means, say the U.S. Catholic bishops. Uh, the preferential option for the poor means that no one is entitled to accumulate still more of what he or she doesn't need when other people are deprived of the bare necessities of life. That's what it means. <laughs> Those bishops had guts because... Rich Catholics and rich everybody everybody had a lot of money. So, no, no, that's anti America, not the anti. But what I'm trying to say here is that there is a, a very pure tradition, the Hebrew tradition, the devout Jews know this, okay? Now Zionist is a completely different animal, okay? And you can see the results of Zionism. Uh, which is preference for the rich, which is preference for people that pretend to be Jews or are Jews and, and are exclusive. I mean, if you can have a Jewish country, that by definition is an exclusive apartheid country. Let's get let's wrap our minds about that around that. So how this comes out is going to be really, really uh, interesting because you know, there are lots of Palestinians that were displaced in 1948. Not all of them ended up in Gaza. A lot of them ended up in Jordan, uh, in Lebanon, in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and all of the neighboring countries. As many people ended up there as you found in Gaza and other places. So, so there's, this, uh, there's this possibility 
that these Palestinians will exert pressure on their own governments. The Saudi government, for example, or, or you know, the Jordanian government. Uh, I think uh, Jordan has a, almost a plurality of, of, of uh, Palestinians in Jordan. So what's going to happen if this, I'm going to say ethnic cleansing, but it's really genocide, okay? Gens, a Latin word for people or tribe, race, side, homicide, killing. So you're killing a whole race of people and that is racist. Let's be mild about it. So what's going to happen when this thing continues and the Israelis are still talking about months and months and months of this. Um, you know, Biden is losing support. If politics is the only thing he cares about, well, he should know that many young people, um, former adherents to the Democratic Party, he's losing them, okay? He's losing them by the droves. And he needs them to win. Not only that, but states like, well, in the Middle West, where there are many Palestinian voters, He's lost them already. So even if it's just a, if it's a matter of justice or of stopping killing, for political reasons, he's going to have to gonna have a face into this thing. And the sooner the better. Uh, in a way, I am surprised by uh, the restraint shown by Hezbollah up there in uh, the northern part, well, southern part of Lebanon, uh, by Iran. Um by Turkey, it's a little bit embarrassing for them to see that the the little Yemenis are the ones that are causing the most trouble, and they are causing serious trouble there in the Red Sea and the approaches to it. So, you know, how this turns out is going to matter a lot. And uh, I think that Biden is worried about a lot of things, including his son. It looks like his son's going to end up in jail. And I don't know if if you know, Nima, whether Joe Biden tunes into these broadcasts, but just on the off chance he does, I have a suggestion for him. It's time for him to spend more time with his family. I think he should uh, say, look, Hunter's in trouble. He needs my full support. Uh, so does my wife. And, and so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to resign. That sounds strange. <laughs> That would be the ideal solution. Now, his vice president is no great shakes, but can she be worse than him? I don't think so.